Hey there guys, Nordic Warrior here. Welcome back to my retrospective boxing series. So this is going to be a special one. And don't be surprised if it turns out to be a very long video. Because the fighter I'm going to be talking about in this video is a fighter whose career I followed very closely. And it's one that I find particularly fascinating. Filled with ups and downs, twists and turns, and he generally had one of the craziest and most dynamic careers I've ever seen in boxing. The fighter I'm talking about is the Rickster, Ricky Burns from Coatbridge, Scotland. Ricky was a fighter who I would say came as a massive shock to the British boxing fraternity. He was a fighter whose rise to the top was particularly slow and difficult, being brought up the hard way without the kind of political protection that was often afforded to British prospects on the rise. He was a fighter who had to overcome several pretty major setbacks at domestic level, being seen as a bit of a joke at one point, losing his most significant early fights in one-sided fashion, and even struggling against domestic level opposition for a while, later going on to not only exceed expectations, but make history. Going from a seemingly limited no-hoper, to a fighter who literally carried Scottish boxing for years, becoming not only a three-weight world champion, but the first ever Scottish fighter to do so, making history. And when examining his record in great detail, and watching his fights back, his career was just so fascinating and unique. So Ricky Burns turned professional in 2001, at just 19 years old, weighing just above the limit for the light welterweight division. After a pretty good amateur career that apparently consisted of over 100 fights, he had his pro debut against veteran journeyman Woody Greenway, winning on points over four rounds. In the early part of his career, he had a string of wins against journeymen, mostly by decision, alternating between lightweight and super featherweight. For his 10th pro fight, he had the first serious test of his career, travelling over to London to take on the undefeated British lightweight champion Graham Earl in an eight-round contest. Earl was a huge favourite for the fight since he was considered a genuine contender at the time, and Ricky was relatively unknown outside of Scotland. In a big upset, Ricky completely schooled Earl, winning by a wide unanimous decision. After a few more lower level victories, Ricky took a huge step up in class, travelling over to Edinburgh to take on the British Commonwealth and European champion and future world champion Alex Arthur. It proved to be a step too far. Arthur completely outboxed Burns over 12 rounds, winning by a wide unanimous decision, giving Burns the first defeat of his career. Despite losing to Arthur, Ricky showed an incredible chin and a huge heart, since Arthur was generally regarded as a massive puncher at the time, stopping most of his opponents at European level. Later that year he had a couple of lower level wins, and the following year he got another shot at the British title, taking on the champion Carl Johansson over in Leeds. Once again it proved to be a step too far, Ricky was completely dominated in the fight, getting dropped multiple times, losing by unanimous decision for the second time in his career. In retrospect, I'm actually surprised that the fight wasn't stopped, since Ricky took an absolute beating for the full 12 rounds. After losing to Johansson, he went back to the drawing board and had a string of victories against Journeyman, before getting a shot at the vacant Commonwealth title, taking on the tough Ghanaian contender Osamano Akaba. The fight was fairly competitive with Akaba's awkward style, giving Ricky some problems, but for the most part Ricky was in control, using long range boxing to control the fight, winning by a wide unanimous decision, becoming Commonwealth Champion. For his first title defence he took on another tough Ghanaian, the dangerous punching contender Yakubu Amidu. Amidu got off to a fast start, applying steady pressure and trying to overpower Ricky, but as the fight went on, Ricky's superior stamina and skills took over dominating the mid part of the fight and stopping Amidu in the 7th round, after having him out on his feet. In my personal opinion, the stoppage was slightly premature, but I digress. For his next title defence, he took on the infamous Michael Gomez. The fight was interesting going in, because Gomez was most famous for his knockout victory over Alex Arthur, who gave Burns his first defeat, and despite being past his prime, was still somewhat dangerous. This was evident because not too long before fighting Burns, he knocked down Amir Khan at lightweight, and gave him a seriously tough fight, before being prematurely stopped in that one. Nonetheless, Ricky completely dominated the fight, winning every single round clearly, and stopping Gomez in the 7th. 
After beating Gomez, Ricky had one more title defence, winning a very competitive unanimous decision against the tough Irishman Kevin O'Hara, whose come-forward aggressive style and solid chin gave Ricky some problems. And it was a fight that, despite clearly winning, left some serious doubts about Ricky's ability to compete at world level in the super featherweight division, since the apparent lack of power seemed to be a problem for him. Shortly after beating O'Hara, he became mandatory challenger to face the undefeated WBO champion Roman Martinez. Martinez was known to many British boxing fans, having won his WBO title in Manchester with an impressive knockout victory over the champion Nicky Cook earlier that year. The fight entered into negotiations. The fight was initially scheduled to take place in Puerto Rico near the end of 2009. However, Martinez's promoter failed to come up with the money for the fight, leading to the fight being cancelled. The following year, Ricky had a stay-busy fight against Yusuf Alhamidi, and shortly after the fight against Martinez was rescheduled to take place in Glasgow, as Ricky's promoter Frank Warren came up with the money for the fight. Going into the fight, Ricky was a huge underdog, with most people thinking that he was going to get knocked out, and very few people gave Ricky much of a chance. Ricky got off to a terrible start, being dropped to the canvas in the first round, and it seemed as if he was going to get stopped early. However, in a shock upset, Ricky came back from the knockdown and completely dominated the rest of the fight, winning by a clear unanimous decision, giving Martinez his first defeat, finally becoming world champion for the first time. A couple of months after beating Martinez, he had a relatively soft first title defence, taking on the Norwegian-based Colombian contender, Andreas Evanson. Ricky scored a knockdown in the opening seconds of the fight, and then proceeded to dominate pretty much every single round, winning by a wide unanimous decision. His second title defence was against the Ghanaian Joseph Larea. Larea was coming off of a shock split decision victory in his previous fight against the popular Scottish prospect Paul Appleby on the undercard of the Evanson fight, so Ricky chose him as his next opponent. Ricky dominated the fight, winning pretty much every round, forcing Larea to quit on his stool after the seventh round. It seemed as if as Ricky's level of competition improved, so did his punching power, and he was developing into a slightly more aggressive and assertive fighter. For his next title defence, he travelled over to Liverpool to take on the former world champion Nicky Cook. Just like Michael Gomez, Cook was most well known for his victory over Alex Arthur, and going into the Burns fight, he had been inactive, and it was revealed during the build-up that he had been struggling with back problems. The fight ended in the first round when Ricky landed a right hand to the body, and Cook's back gave out, forcing him to be stopped in the first round. After beating Cook, Ricky was in negotiations for a fight against his mandatory challenger Adrian Broner, from America. Reports varied on what took place, but from what I can gather, Broner, despite being a relatively unknown prospect at the time, didn't want to travel to Scotland for the fight, despite Ricky being the champion and the clear A-side. When negotiations for the fight fell through, Ricky decided to move up in weight, since he'd been struggling to make super featherweight for a while, and couldn't comfortably make it anymore. Upon moving up to lightweight, Ricky became the mandatory challenger for the WBO champion Juan Manuel Marquez. Marquez decided to move up two divisions to face his rival Manny Pacquiao, leading to the WBO calling for an interim fight between Ricky and the Australian brawler Michael Katsidis. The fight took place in Liverpool, and going into the fight, Katsidis was a huge favourite. I remember so clearly going into that fight, pretty much everybody was picking Katsidis to knock Burns out, and very few people gave Burns a chance. And uh, I just don't see how Ricky Burns will be able to deal with Michael Cassidis. I think Cassidis walks through him. Ricky went on to pull off the upset once again, completely outboxing Cassidis over 12 rounds, winning by a wide unanimous decision. Shortly after beating Cassidis, when it became clear that Marquez wasn't going to defend the title, Ricky was elevated to full champion status by the WBO. For his first defense of his lightweight title, Ricky took on what at the time was considered a massive risk, taking on the former WBA world champion Moses Paulus. In a surprising performance, Ricky completely dominated the fight, winning pretty much every single round of the fight and winning by a wide unanimous decision. For his next title defence, he had the biggest fight of his career so far, at least in terms of public interest. 
taking on the popular British contender Kevin Mitchell. Going into the fight, despite Mitchell being stopped by Michael Katsidis a few years earlier, the fight was generally considered 50-50, with Ricky being only a slight favourite. Since many fans and pundits thought that Mitchell had the skills, the power and the athletic ability to win, in a great performance that surprised pretty much everybody, Ricky completely dominated the fight, scoring two knockdowns and stopping Mitchell in the fourth round, in what in my personal opinion was the best performance of his career. After beating Mitchell, Ricky was set to fight the IBF champion Miguel Vasquez in a unification fight. The fight was scheduled to take place in London, and preparations began. However, shortly before the fight was due to take place, Vasquez announced that he hadn't signed a contract, and the fight was cancelled, leading to a massive legal battle between Ricky and his promoter Frank Warren. Ricky later signed with Eddie Hearn and Matchroom Sport, while his long legal battle with Frank Warren was ongoing. For his next title defence, he took on the undefeated Puerto Rican contender Jose Gonzalez. Now if you guys have never seen that fight, I would highly recommend that you watch it, because it was one of the craziest comebacks I've ever seen in boxing. For the first seven rounds, Gonzalez gave Ricky a boxing lesson, and put an absolute beating on him. The fight was so one-sided that in the seventh round, Gonzalez decided to completely unload on Ricky, emptying the tank and trying to force a stoppage. However, he wasted so much energy, and Ricky came back and stunned him at the end of the round. For the next couple of rounds, Gonzalez was completely gassed, and Ricky picked up the pace, and completely took over the fight. After the ninth round, Gonzalez quit on his stool, claiming to have an injured wrist, leading to an incredible comeback victory for Ricky. Despite getting the victory, the lack of defensive reflexes and the sloppy performance led to some speculation that Ricky was on the slide, since he was getting caught with huge punches in the first seven rounds, and he looked distracted and uncoordinated. After beating Gonzalez, Ricky took on the tough Mexican contender Ramundo Beltran. Beltran broke Ricky's jaw early in the fight, scored a knockdown in round eight, and appeared to win the fight clearly. However, in an extremely controversial decision, the fight was scored a draw, with Ricky managing to hold on to his title. This got Ricky a lot of criticism, and he lost a lot of fans as a result of it. His next fight, he took on the undefeated future pound-for-pound -pound star Terence Crawford. The fight was close and competitive in spots, but for the most part, the bigger, stronger, younger, and fresher Crawford was in control, winning by a clear unanimous decision, giving Ricky the third defeat of his career. After losing to Crawford, Ricky took on the undefeated Montenegrin contender Dejan Zlatichanin. Ricky got off to a terrible start, being dropped in the first round, and being dominated for most of the first half of the fight, looking a shadow of his former self. He once again seemed uncoordinated and sloppy. He made a comeback in the second half, winning most of the later rounds, but it wasn't enough to win the fight, losing by a close split decision, with the knockdown being the difference. This led to several calls for Ricky to retire, as it seemed like his time at world level was over. Nonetheless, Ricky decided to continue his career, taking on the fringe contender Alexandra Lepele in an eight-rounder. Interestingly, on a side note, Lepele had a victory over the future Spanish contender Sandor Martin, who I personally rate very highly, but I digress. Ricky dominated the fight, scoring a knockdown and winning by a wide unanimous decision. For his next fight, Ricky travelled over to America to fight the undefeated contender, Omar Figueroa, in his hometown of Texas. Ricky pretty much dominated the entire fight and won most of the rounds clearly. However, the fight was in Texas, which is of course extremely well known for corrupt officiating, and in one of the worst decisions I have ever seen. Despite Ricky clearly winning the fight, the three American judges all gave the fight to Figueroa by a wide margin. Ricky also had two points deducted by the infamous Texan referee Lawrence Cole, who protected the home fighter all night. The loss once again led to calls for Ricky to retire, since it seemed like another world title fight was unlikely. Interestingly, being robbed against Figueroa in America seemed to give Ricky a bit of renewed spirit, and he once again went back to the drawing board. He went back to domestic level and decided to move up in weight again. He had a couple of impressive wins, including an 11th round knockout win over Josh King, 
before getting a surprise shot at the vacant WBA World Light Welterweight title against the European champion from Italy, Michele De Rocco, back in Glasgow. Ricky dominated the fight and stopped De Rocco in the 8th round, becoming the first Scottish fighter to ever win a world title in three divisions. For his first title defence at light welterweight, he took on the undefeated Belarusian contender, Kirill Relic. Ricky got off to a slow start, losing the first two rounds. However, by the third round, Ricky completely took over the fight, schooling Relic for the next seven rounds, winning them all clearly. Relic made a comeback in round 10, hurting Ricky badly, and finishing the fight strongly. However, the seven rounds that Ricky won in the mid part of the fight was enough to secure the victory, winning by a clear unanimous decision. I remember at the time there were people calling the fight a robbery, which is utter nonsense. Because as I said, Ricky won seven rounds in a row, making it a clear 7-5 victory. I think that was another fight where the Sky Sports commentary influenced people to think the fight was closer than it actually was, but I digress. For his next fight, he had a unification fight against the undefeated Namibian, IBF and IBO world champion Julius Ndongo. Ndongo was coming off of a shock first round knockout win over the undefeated Russian knockout artist. Edward Trojanovsky, and was seen as a bit of a one-hit wonder. Nonetheless, Ndongo completely schooled Ricky, giving him the most one-sided defeat of his entire career, ending his third reign as world champion. This once again led to many calls for Ricky to retire. Nonetheless, he decided to continue his career. Ricky returned to the lightweight division and travelled over to Manchester, taking on the former WBA world champion Anthony Crawler in an interesting crossroads fight. In what was a great fight that was competitive throughout, Crawler won by a close but clear unanimous decision. Some people had Ricky winning, but I personally thought Crawler's work rate kept him a step ahead, and that it was a fair decision, but I digress. Ricky once again continued his career and had a couple of impressive knockout victories, including a third round KO of Scott Cardle. He then went over to London to take on the former world featherweight champion Lee Selby. Ricky put on a surprisingly good performance, outworking, outboxing and outlanding Selby, winning the fight clearly, however in a pretty shocking decision. Ricky lost the fight by a majority decision, however I personally believe Ricky won the fight clearly. This time the robbery seemed to completely discourage Ricky, and it seemed at that point like he was actually going to finally retire. He took a break spending over two years away from the ring, before making a comeback in Newcastle against the journeyman Emiliano Dominguez, winning by a wide unanimous decision in a very one-sided fight. Since the Dominguez fight, Ricky has been inactive and no fights have been announced, leading to the general opinion of him being retired from the sport. So yeah, that was a pretty intense and riveting career, and a really interesting one to go through, and it's one that I find particularly fascinating. So how good was Ricky Burns? How would he have done in today's era, or any era besides his own? Let's talk about it. So Ricky Burns, in my personal opinion, is a perfect example of how sometimes hard work, commitment and perseverance can trump talent. Ricky was never the most talented fighter. He wasn't a noted puncher. He wasn't particularly athletic or spectacular in any area. And when compared to other Scottish world champions in and around about his era, it's true that I don't think he was anywhere near as talented as the likes of Scott Harrison or Alex Arthur. But despite this, he went on to achieve so much more than both of them put together. In the early part of Ricky's career, you would never have expected him to become world champion, never mind a three division champion. When examining his resume too, it was actually a lot better than I initially thought. He beat several world class fighters during his career, and even won in some huge upsets, proving fans and pundits wrong on several occasions. His wins over Martinez, Katsidis, Mitchell and Paulus were all fights that many people expected him to lose, and he should have also had wins over Selby and Figueroa, in my personal opinion, which would have made his resume look even more impressive. He was a fighter who was consistent throughout his career, always in shape, and always taking every single fight seriously. He had a great chin and a huge heart. His boxing fundamentals were solid, and he knew his way around a ring. He did have some glaring flaws though. His lack of power relative to his size was always a problem at world level. 
and he seemed to have no idea how to fight on the inside against a world-class pressure fighter. But at long range behind a jab, and while fighting off the ropes, he was deadly. There are a few fights I would have liked to have seen him in that could have happened, such as the Broner fight that was talked about for years, as well as a fight against Jorge Linares, which would have been interesting. Prime for Prime, I actually think he could have beaten both of them. Against the elites from the super featherweight division to the light welterweight division, however, I see him as little more than an awkward fight for most of them. Since, like I said, he didn't have the best power and he wasn't the most talented fighter. He's lucky that he didn't fight Marquez since I think he would have gotten schooled in that fight. And the likes of Lomachenko would probably be a bit too much for him. Another fight I think would have been interesting is if he fought Crawford a couple of years earlier than he did when Ricky was in his prime. Maybe it would have been a different fight, but nonetheless, Ricky had a fascinating career, and one that I look back on with a lot of nostalgia. Thanks for watching guys, I really enjoyed reviewing the career of Ricky Burns. Stay tuned for more retrospective career reviews. Once again, I have a lot of them coming to the channel in the near future. Thanks for watching and God bless.